online files and look at this. And he said, no, I don't know to tell you. The professor will send you a copy of uh, the uh, chapter that this uh, presentation comes from that I wrote about 10 years ago. And it's about uh, the transformation of Barcelona branding, or Barcelona as a brand, in the last uh, 25 years. I don't know if you're familiar with the city of Barcelona, but uh, it was a huge transformation on the city during the 1992 Olympics. Uh, it was way before you were born in general. So, but uh, 1992 was a very uh, turning point in the history of the city of Barcelona. Everything was changed afterwards. And now it's becoming a really, it's becoming a, a sort of a problem right now because there are a number of tourists that we receive in the city are making everything quite difficult because housing, for example, is extremely expensive right now. Uh, the jobs are all directed towards tourism. I think we receive like something around over 10 million tourists a year. So it's, it's a lot. So it's a, it's a so called always crowded every year after year. And it's not such a big city. Barcelona as a city itself is about 1.7 million. And as a metropolitan area, it's probably around four or five, something like that. So it's not a very large city. So let me go into this. It's a weird name, and uh, you'll get to know what, why it's coming from. And during the last 25 years, the city has been transformed enormously uh, due to the changes created by the Olympic Games in 1992. Uh, Barcelona was elected to be the, the next uh, Olympic city in 1986, and that year coincided in the year that Spain joined the European Union, at that time the European Union. So the transformation at the local level also has some impact, it has also has some relations on the changes at the national level and the European level. So let me go with this. This is some of this uh, construction of the image and you can see how Barcelona is becoming, uh, and that's kind of a weird thing for someone. It's like, um, it's a city that honestly, when I was a kid, was not a very popular city among tourists. It was probably even a city that people would skip visiting when you go into Spain, and instead favoring places like Havana or Seville or Madrid. But then in a matter of these 10 or 15 years, the image has changed and transformed completely. Here you have some uh, <coughs> headlines from different journals around the world talking about the beauty of Barcelona. We can get into much more recent ones in which we start to promote a very negative type of image due to the massive tourism. Uh, the label, uh, the city as a label, so Barcelona became a very important thing, and then they started to talk about this idea of Barcelona model, uh, in which uh, they talked about how a city that used to be an industrial city can be transformed into a very cool and attractive city for tourists. Then the promotion involves all sorts of media, and among others, uh, there's this movie by Woody Allen that's called Barcelona, uh, uh, Cristina Barcelona, that in part, I don't know if you're familiar with this, it was paid by a producer from Barcelona. The only um, requisite that producer asked Woody Allen is they have to have Barcelona in the title. That's why I always think this is the weirdest title Woody Allen ever put in any of their movies because they have to be there, but it hasn't, doesn't have much meaning. The movie was not such a great movie, but it came from a sort of a, a huge commercial to attract people for the city of Barcelona, showing some of the most important monuments. But let me go backwards into the 1980s, and I don't know if you ever seen this uh, logo yet. Uh, you know it? Was it in the images of uh, uh, Barcelona? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's from a bank. It's a local bank that's called La Caixa. It's, um, at the moment, I think it's one of the second or the third largest banks in Spain and one of the largest banks in Europe right now. And this uh, comes from a very small local type of entity that was created at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so the creation of this logo 
for me, uh, it's a way to understand how Barcelona has created this global image from a local perspective. So let me go backwards. The Kasha, the squad is gone in Spain as a savings bank. I don't know if you have something like that here. That is basically a bank that is, works with uh, uh, small customers to give them a small loans to buy a house, for example, or to do some savings. But it's not a very, very large bank. That's not how it was created. That's why the name of the Caja, if you can see the old logo, is Caja de Pensiones, which means the pensions, what the elderly people get, so you know, the, the retired people, for the old, para la y de ahorros, and to save. So it's a, it was a place to get your pensions from the government, and also to do some small savings. That's how it was created. This is the headquarters of this bank at the beginning of the 20th century. It was built under the modernist style in Barcelona, uh, in one of the most central streets in the city. So you can see this old fashioned type of logo and an old fashioned type of building in this uh, bank at the beginning. So what happens later is that La Caixa, it was the nickname of the work of the, of the bank, became a much larger bank. This is the new headquarters in the upper part of the city where the, the financial district is. And they still keep this old logo, so they didn't like it very much. The logo was still old fashioned, uh, not really international, extremely really local oriented, and they wanted to create something completely new. And that's when the story became very, very interesting. Uh, they hired a brand company, a branding company, a, com a marketing company in the United States that's been very popular for creating the new logo for Coca-Cola, transforming Coca-Cola into Coke or making uh, the new logos for all these banks. The Deutsche Bank, obviously for the Deutsche Bank, the eagle represents all the bad stuff of the, of the world, so they move it into this just slash type of in, inside of square. Of the back of the Scotland, they got this completely geometric logo. So they liked it very much. The evolution of, of these branding and banks, and so they also did the new branding for Iberia, the Spanish wine company, and they did all the Coca-Cola and all that stuff. So they hired these guys that were based in San Francisco and came to Barcelona to do a study what the brand should be. Then they started to study the different inputs and so on, and according to the story, they came up with seven or eight different options. The board, the executive board that has to make the decision, each of them like and one. And then obviously the chief executive officer, the chief, was completely upset because after paying a lot of money, now we have a divided board with different options on the board. So we should get something new. But then she got like a final option, a new one. And the new option was a very interesting thing because the Chief Executive Officer of the La Caixa at that time, it was one of the elite, elitist uh, families, most prestigious families in the city, has a very good connection with this painter. I don't know if you're familiar with him, it's Juan Miró, is a famous Catalan painter from this abstractive, uh, abstract type of painting. And they asked him, well, since you are a close friend of Juan Miró, why did you ask him? to write, to paint the logo for us. And the logo became uh, part of this tapestry that's now in the headquarters of the bank. It's a huge tapestry, it probably covers all these walls. And he said, well, I'm gonna do a tapestry and I'm gonna put the logo inside the square to make it very clear that that will be the logo. And here you have the original tapestry on the top and with the logo inside the square. Uh, there's always been a kind of a legend about what the logo means. It just looks like the star is really not a star, it's a man putting a coin, the yellow line, inside the bank into a, how it's called, a big uh, savings box. So there were, that's one of the logo's things. But it became a very 
breaking completely the images of uh, branding of any type of company in Spain using these primary colors with a very simple, like a more children drawing, uh, and a very impacted, uh, really easy to uh, recognize. And then, as you said, you, you recognize immediately because it's a logo that is easy to recognize. It became an immediate success. But here it's a very interesting thing. They wanted to create a logo that was completely international by connecting with a local artist. So this combination of the two. And then I think, from my point of view, Barcelona has gone through the same strategy. Creating an international image is keeping well-kept, well-preserved local identity. We're going to get into that in just a second. So the logo was immediate success, and then this is how that was copied by different companies in Spain. Uh, this is actually the logo that they was used for the um, uh, improvement, you know, tourism, uh, tourist uh, agency from Spain, another bank, another <coughs> bank, uh, and this is probably the most famous one because that was the logo for the Barcelona Olympics. So. That logo was recreated in different forms, into the, but the first one was one that won by La Caixa. Uh, it was later used by the city of Barcelona for the Olympics and also by a campaign that it was called uh, during, after the Olympics, that was called Barcelona Costa Tuapa, that means something like uh, Barcelona make yourselves handsome or pretty. The idea is that the government was paying a lot of money to for improvements of the facades of the houses, to put flowers on the balconies, to, to clean it up and make it a nicer uh, image. So that was the logo for a long time, and now Barcelona has been transformed and they use this B with this un, uh, underlying uh, line uh, that's much more simpler, but that's the one they use it because the other one is being abused. So they want it to be something different. Uh, the way it's been used over and over with the, um, the Barcelona has created over the last, that's another handicap for the city of Barcelona is that if you think carefully, I don't know if you've ever been there or you ever heard about it, but it's not the city that does have any of those attractions that any other major city in Europe you should have. If you go to Paris or London or Rome, there will be major museums in those cities. Barcelona does not any, none of them is very, very important. Obviously, it is not comparable to El Prado. Or Picasso is probably the worst Picasso museum in, in the world. You know, it has a very uh, simple, you know, Picasso was living in Barcelona for a very short period of time when he was a child. Uh, his family was from the southern part of Spain, from Malaga and moved to, his father was a art teacher, and he was moved to Barcelona and started to work in the art school in Barcelona. And then Picasso moved with him, obviously, and started to paint in Barcelona. But he left Barcelona when he was between 16 and 18 to Paris and never returned. So he was visiting, but never stayed back in Barcelona. So the collection that we have in Picasso Museum is basically the paintings from that early age. They are beautiful because painted, uh, he was already a, a good painter, but he wasn't the best one. I'm sorry? The type of the buildings in the very Barcelona. The type of the buildings, yes. yes. The buildings are probably the most recognized things, but that does make us very different because if you go to Brussels, you will have similar buildings like this. So but if you go other country of Austria, Vienna, there will be similar buildings. But what they did for the museum, which is very interesting, is that you, you talked that about the fact that there are no attractions no. and no attractions in Barcelona. But for the museum, they did something very interesting: is that they devoted a space for children to discover the paintings yeah. as well, which was very intelligent because well, this will attract they, families. But I think they've done it in several museums around the world. Like, at least I know for the United States, they do it a lot. No, it is one way of promoting yeah. it. But what I'm trying to say is that in Madrid we have the Prado, that's probably one of mm. the best collections in Europe from that period of time, from the 16th, 17th, 18th century. If you 
you go to Amsterdam, you have the Rijks Museum. If you go to London, you have the, the National Gallery, the, the day, the, modern, the British Museum. You go to Paris, obviously, it has the largest museum ever, you know, the Louvre, and then the uh, Musée de Rosset and all that stuff. Barcelona doesn't have any top-ranked museums. That's what I mean. So we don't have anything that makes it attractive from that point of view. Second, we don't have any major um, monument. We don't have the Coliseum on, and that's it. Then, I don't know if you know that, we have, now it's very famous, it's silly that they cannot use the internet, but if you check on the internet <coughs> and look for best urban beaches on the world, Barcelona is ranked among the top 10. It depends who has ranked it. All the beaches in Barcelona are man-made, didn't exist when I was a kid. They are completely new. So they clean it up, an area that was completely industrial, put sand, and now we have a beach. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, Barcelona has been uh, very active in creating this uh, sort of an image of a very attractive, and then we have to do it by creating a, a brand around all these different things. This is a different museums in Barcelona, um, the Museum Maritime, the National Museum of Art of Catalonia, that is basically an uh, medieval history, medieval art. Cosmo Casha, that is part of the Casha, the bank a collection that is basically modern art, and the Picasso Museum, obviously. Casha Forum, that is another of the Casha stuff. Uh, in this case, it's more like um, Cosmo Casha is more a uh, science museum, Casha Forum is more contemporary art, and then obviously Macbana, that is one of the new attractions to the city, that is the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona. On top of this, we have all these cultural things like uh, the Liceo, the Opera House, the Palau de la Musica, Auditori, Teatro Nacional, all these type of things. But obviously, the most well known thing in Barcelona by far is the football. Yes. Yeah, and it's actually at the moment it's the most visited museum in Barcelona. I think it's the second most visited museum in Spain. And it's the Barça Museum, and it's kind of a compound thing, and it's it's a huge enterprise right now. The other thing they did, and it was very very successful, is this creation of Barcelona Plateau Field Commission. So they created, in order to create an image of the city, what we should do, we needed to have the city on movies, on films, on uh, on commercials. So the city hall created this company that uh, papers all sorts of filming from footage shooting of uh, fashion models in the beach to uh, real movies on gen in general in the city of Barcelona. They wanted to become a sort of New York. If you ever been in New York, you know New York already because you've seen it thousands of times in the movies. But they wanted to do this exactly the same thing in Barcelona. And it's been quite successful. I work in an area very close to the center and it's always something going on and shooting. So sometimes it's just commercials or uh, uh, shootings for clothing, stuff like that. But in general, it's constantly. We have a very good weather like you do here, so there's a lot of time to do shootings and stuff like that all the time. Okay. And then the last part that the city is being promoted in a very strong way uh, is the university system. Uh, since it's such an extractive uh, city, it attracts students from all over Europe, especially through the Erasmus program, and it's one of the most popular growth destinations, but also has created a sort of a rhythm of students coming and going. Let me uh, get very short into this. I think Barcelona has gone into four different areas uh, in constructing their own um, image. On one side, uh, there is, a, as you know, Barcelona is the capital of a region that is called Catalonia that has the desire to be independent from the rest of Spain and a really strong identity roots. So in the city fabric, there is a lot of uh, elements that build the idea that Barcelona is different from the rest of Spain. So that it's not part of a culture of the Spanish culture, that it's part of another culture that's 
why, for example, in Barcelona, the bullfighting uh, spectacles are, the bullfighting shows are forbidden. So it's not possible to do bullfighting in Barcelona. So uh, right now. It's been a long tradition of bullfighting in Barcelona, but now it's not possible. Second thing, uh, they want to preserve their history. But they want to preserve the history in a way that in reinforce this idea of Barcelona as a different city from the rest of the Spain. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. <coughs> Second, uh, rationality, uh, uh, modernity, a city that is functioning, that works very good for businesses, and finally this idea of cosmopolitanism. What I'm trying to say with these four corners is that some cases these things interact in a positive way, sometimes they not, they really um, uh, block each other or um, they are contradict each other, What's, that's what I wanted to say. So imagine, for example, construction national identity. We need to buy, to build a new space for a new train station. Immediately it will be a conflict because it will be something that is very particular for the history that they don't want to, we don't want to use it as for a, a train station because it will in conflict with this uh, idea of preservation. So that's one of the big issues in Barcelona. I'm not going to go into the city of Barcelona, but Barcelona has created their own image. Uh, in that intention of creating an image of Barcelona different from the rest of the Spain, they have emphasized a lot the medieval ages. That's what it makes us different from the rest of the Spanish uh, the Spanish uh, territories. The truth is, Barcelona was the first part, uh, you know, during the, the main difference between Catalonia and the rest of the Spain is most of the kingdoms that were created in the Middle Ages in the northern part of the Spain were the areas that were less influenced by the Muslim invasion during the 700s. Uh, Barcelona was under the Muslim rule for about 100 years. And there's no reminiscences and there is no recalls about that time. That part is completely neglected in our history because they don't like it. Because they will connect it with the rest of the Spain. It's nothing to do with you or with the people in Northern Africa. It's more to do with make us different from the rest of Spain. On the other side, they portray themselves as the capital city, the northern city of Spain that is more European than it's Spanish. So here you have different examples of how this, for example, Plaza del Rey, that is one of the emblematic spaces in the city center, has been completely restructured in order to look much more medieval than it really was. So even the most historic buildings have been moved from one place to another in order to make an ensemble that looks much more medieval. This is how the intention for the, the first drawings, how the Palazzo del Rey should be. You can see this building over here is this building over here. And it was not finished that way, but the intention is to create a historicist type of approach, making this look of the medieval times different. The other thing they've done is creating these buildings at the beginning of the 20th century that resembles buildings from uh, other parts of Europe. So this connection with Europe rather than in connection with the rest of Spain. Uh, the most, uh, well, I'm gonna jump into this because it will be too difficult. Let me go to another topic and I will conclude with this. Um, the other thing is very interesting. So here we saw how a brand uses, uh, in the case of the bank, use a local artist to create an image that connected with the local culture, but also create a cosmopolitan international approach. So that's one direction. The other direction I wanted to do is the other way around. How um, the culture of a place is reinvented for a particular brand. So let me put it together. When I was in the 1980s, it's a new phenomenon started to happen in the United States. Uh, the United States started to discover the coffee places. They didn't have coffee places. They're not the ever been in the coffee. You know, they drink these huge coffees that taste like water, 
and they don't do any, any they, don't, they don't have a culture of the coffee. Some uh, young uh, students, in a way, came to Europe for studying for a while and get completely immersed in the culture of coffee places around Europe. In this case, a coffee place in Vienna, but you can have coffee places in, uh, in Austria, in uh, France, in, in, uh, in Paris, in all the all these southern part of Europe. So they got very interested in this type of coffee places. Obviously, these coffee places have been portrayed in paintings by different authors from Van Gogh to Zan and so on. So they started to get very much interested in reproducing the coffee scene in the US. This is the Quapergas, that's one of the coffee places in Barcelona that was famous because it was were the places that uh, Picasso used to hang out when he was a young, uh, young artist. This is one of the last few coffee, original coffee places in Barcelona. Café de la Opera is just in front of the Opera House, the Liceo Opera House, and so on. Well, let me go into this. So the people of the coffee places in America, and that's a very interesting point from you, from you that you're doing marketing. Americans are really a nightmare in terms of choices. They don't really like to get one choice. I don't know how you order a coffee here, but in my country, it's basically what coffee you want. Large coffee, short coffee, with milk, without milk. That's it. Okay, did you ever been in a Starbucks? <laughs> a Starbucks that is the example of, if you go to America, basically you have coffee from Jamaica, coffee from Costa Rica, coffee from Brazil, coffee from, coffee with a cherry flavor, coffee with vanilla flavor, coffee with a strawberry flavor, coffee with uh, the decaf coffee, not decaf coffee, coffee with milk and, and I believe there is more than 100 options in a coffee place. That's a traditional way to do places things. So how to incorporate a coffee tradition from Europe that is basically one single kind of coffee, you can get it double or single, but that's it, into the American thing. Second thing, they like to go in the run, so they don't understand, and that's something that I think is extremely Mediterranean. The Americans don't understand, we don't like to work and eat at the same time. Eat is something we do socially, and work is something we do afterwards. So we eat, and we have fun, then we work. But mixing both things, impossible. So I don't know if you ever go to the Americans, they, they go and mix both things. They, they do all these, you know, in the classes. I don't know if it's allowed here, but students from America eat in the classes, constantly. And for us, it is not. But even if it's allowed, it's not it? well seen. The other thing we are, I don't know if it's here, but I suppose it's exactly the same thing. You are not supposed to eat in between meals. So you eat for lunch and you eat for dinner, and maybe you have a short snack, but you don't keep eating constantly. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, let me go for this, and I will finish with this very shortly. Um, <laughs> it came out that a Dutch guy that was living in San Francisco opened a shop called Starbucks, because Starbucks is uh, one of the characters of Moby, the novel. That Starbucks shop was selling, no, I'm sorry, the Dutch guy opened a shop that was selling beans, coffee beans, and people can get it and live it. Some of these entrepreneurs from Seattle copied the idea, instead of just selling the beans, said, well, we're going to sell the beans and also brew the beans, so we can serve coffee from different locations. It's very much like you were in a winery or in a, in a olive oil a company that they can offer different kinds. They both, I don't know if you knew that, but the people who were in charge of uh, Starbucks at the very beginning were literature professors of English. So that's why they choose Moby Dick. 
Uh, and then Starbucks, I don't know, I haven't read it, I have to be honest. But one of the char characters is something called like Starbucks. Uh, the logo, I don't know if you ever noticed, is a mermaid. The mermaid used to show the breast, but uh, the, it was became controversial and the breast disappeared. It's covered with uh, hair and all that stuff, so that you cannot see it. But it's basically a mermaid. And they also went to Italy and they tried to copy the Italian flavor of coffee place. So they put these black and white tails on the floor. Uh, they used aprons with uh, colorful aprons like the ones they do in Italy and so on. But the difference is that they are not resting. They have sofas and so on, but it's always on the run, so you have to carry your coffee. That's something they don't understand. Coffee is to sit in one place and drink it, not to run with it. And I don't know if you ever tried, if you ever tried the coffee shops on Starbucks, they serve it so extremely hot. But so extremely hot that it's, you pour it onto yourself, you burn yourself, honestly. So that's how the Starbucks became a franchise. So my idea is how this culture can be reimported back to Europe. So it's a culture that originated in Europe. It's a very old historic tradition. It's all over the Mediterranean that we have very similar look of places. I've been seeing in all these coffee places that almost disappear in Barcelona. So everyone is sitting just enjoying watching the people pass. That's something that's very traditional all over. How we can reimport the Starbucks things? And at the beginning, we thought, well, that will be impossible because the coffee here is like six times more expensive than a regular coffee. You know, coffee in Barcelona is around one euro. One euro, one short coffee. Uh, that will be what, three dinners, more or less. Uh, but a coffee here, there is nothing less than six or seven euros. So it's six times more expensive. And it's six times worse, I promise. It's a very bad coffee. So the only thing they have very good is the pastries. They have the muffins, that part is good. So when you go there, don't drink coffee, just eat. And then go. And they have free Wi-Fi. That's why it's becoming very popular. So the idea is that how we can reimport this thing in. And this is when the rhetoric that the city has created about itself. So the history of Barcelona is based on this medieval, glorious medieval past, and then a very industrialist society trading with the Americas in the 19th century, and then uh, the success of this bourgeois, industrial bourgeoisie during the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. So at the end, what happens is that we created our own coffee places in Barcelona, reinterpreting the idea of the coffee place. In those places that look so old, they're completely brand new. They, they are, have an ambience that look like very post-colonial. So they even have the coffee bean bags on one corner of the, of the room, you know, to show it looks like the, the ships just came from the Americas or from Africa bringing the coffee, and then you have this ambience of uh, um, colonial times. But they are completely new, and you can see they are colonial, they are very new because they, you also can have the choices. Here you have thousands of choices on coffee, and the prices are much higher than in traditional places. So I'm trying to say that. While La Caixa used an artist to create a, an image and create an um, international image using a local artist, the coffee places used the rhetoric that the city of Barcelona has constructed about itself to build their own coffee approach. Actually, they are not even Spanish companies. They are mostly Italian companies. And the names of the companies resemble Italian. So there is called Café di Roma, Café di Francesco, or Jamaica, or stuff like that. So, so all these coffees are completely new. So that's more or less, I don't know if it's, it's, it's clear and it was kind of a dis, disorganized in the presentation. But that's what I wanted to say. I think this is the last one, yeah. You reminded me of the song that they, 
the song made for now that I'm, that you were given examples remind me of the song by Freddie Mercury, Barcelona. Yeah, but was the intention it was uh, Barcelona was a song that I think uh, Freddie Mercury wanted to sing with a soprano from exactly. Barcelona, Mark, uh, Montserrat Caballer. Exactly. And and they used that interest by Freddie Mercury on doing this song to use the song as the inauguration song for the Olympics. Unfortunately, Freddie Mercury died about six months before the Olympics started, mm -hmm. so there was never used for the Olympics because he died. But it's become a sort of an yes. anthem of the city of Barcelona, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. you have questions?